All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, gosh, it seems like we've all been stuck in a Songkran holiday, and now we're back to work. So it's great to be here. Um, we, we were a little bit later in talking about our performance for the strategies. So today, we're going to pick that up. I want to welcome everybody um, onto the stream. Uh, my name is Andrew Stotts, and in fact, I'm at my home office right now, and I've just had a nice cup of coffee, a nice cup of espresso by Coffee Works. And I hope that you've had your lunch and you've got a coffee, cu cup of coffee, a cup of tea, whatever you prefer, and make sure to say hi. Just use the chat for questions and saying hi. I see Jing Jing says, Sawadee Krap, good to see you. And welcome everybody, make sure to put your questions in the chat. It's a turbulent time in the markets, and we're going to see that a little bit in the strategies. So feel free to ask any questions. Uh, I'll be talking about the all weather strategies and uh, be taking any questions that you may have. I see another one. I am gone who says hi. Good to see you. Yep. So welcome, everybody. And why don't I share my screen and I'm going to start my presentation and go through the latest of updating the performance. I'm here for you, so make sure if you have a question, just submit it into the chat and I will answer every question that you have. Let me now get myself prepared to share the screen. One second. All right. Hopefully you see the screen now. Let me just double check that. Yep. So I am going to put the screen in oops, wrong mode, I think. Hold on one second. A little technical difficulty there. One second. While everybody's coming in, good to see you. Kuna Tip says, hello, John Andrew, good to see you. Feel free to say hello, and let me now see if I can get my screen working again properly. Hold on one second. It's a little bit of a technical difficulty there. I'm going to do this now. Let's see. Welcome, everybody. Feel free to ask your questions once we get going. I'm just getting my uh, slides up and running, so just give me a second. All right. Hopefully, hopefully you can see that. Let's see if we can bring that up onto the screen, and hopefully if we do that, we'll be able to see it. All right. I think it's there now. Fantastic. All right. So we are looking at the review of March. We are already into April, but... We've updated some numbers, but mainly we're looking at what's going on uh, in the portfolio. So feel free to ask your questions in the chat. I love to hear your questions, so feel free. So remember that our allocation strategies are global. There's a tiny bit of Thailand in there because Thailand's in the global strategies, but it's also long-term in that we're trying to gain from long-term equity return. And it's diversified across asset classes, regions, sectors, and companies. Now, let's remember why we're here. It's to build wealth over the long term. And I see six pillars of investing. The first is to invest in stocks. Stocks have offered returns that significantly outpace bonds and gold. And wealth accumulation comes from owning pieces of companies and tapping into the growth that their management teams produce. Number two is to reduce risk. You want to mitigate investment risk by spreading your portfolio across various companies, sectors, countries, and asset classes. And overexposure to any one asset class is dangerous. Number three is to contribute regularly. You want to implement some sort of dollar cost averaging by consistently investing a fixed amount over time. And this reduces the impact of volatility and can lower the average cost of your investments enhancing your long-term returns. Number four is stay invested. You want to embrace a long-term perspective. The true potential of compounding unfolds over decades, demanding patience and discipline. Number five, well, speaking of discipline, in fact, I just saw on uh, Instagram a lady 
who had the world record for sitting at standings, uh, you know, being in a plank position for more than, what was it, four hours? It was incredible. Adherence to your investment strategy is paramount. You want to avoid acting based on emotions by sticking to a well-considered plan. And number six is continued learning. Deepen your understanding of fundamental and technical analysis and stay informed about market dynamics and refine your strategies by learning from successes and failures. So we create our strategies for decades. This is a picture of me when I came to Thailand. There I am at 100. But our aim is to create strategies that perform over many decades. I've laid out most of these principles in the book, How to Start Building Your Wealth, Investing in the Stock Market. And some of you have read it. If you haven't, I suggest that you do because it provides a foundation. Now, our goal is to deliver steady returns over the long run. Here I show all three of our strategies, each of them starting at 100. AWS launched in February of 2019 and targets a 6% per annum return. And Alpha Focus was launched in October of 2021 and we target an 8% return. And Inflation Guard was launched in July uh, in 2022 and we're targeting a 4% return with these strategies. These are our goals and you may find that one strategy works for you at some point and another one works for you at another point. Now, from when we started Inflation Guard in July of 2022, the strategies are performing almost as expected. So moderate risk AWS has had the highest return since that time. Inflation Guard has had lowest return, but also the lowest volatility. And Alpha Focus has been slightly underperforming AWS during that time. What you can see here, and I'm going to grab my, uh, my pen, you can see that Alpha Focus has more volatility, more volatility in the upsides and in the downside. And that's part of when volatility is working right, it really can take off. But when it's working poorly, it can get hit. Now, since July 2022, all strategies have had lower volatility than world equity. AWS had slightly higher return than world equity. And we mix asset classes rather than hold pure equity to try to avoid a portion of market down drawdowns. But it means that we also miss portions of the market booms, as you can see here. Now, <clears throat> we're going to go through the following things, but let's start with talking about the performance of our strategies. First, we're going to talk about the performance of all weather, and we're talking about March now. All weather strategy is 85% in equity, as you can see right here. And the performance as of March, well, it was up 19% above a 60-40 portfolio since inception. So what we can see is 44.9% up relative to the 60-40 since inception. And this is after fees. And we can see that in the month of March, the strategy was up 3.6, which was 1.7 above the 60-40 portfolio. Our 25% target allocations to develop Europe, Japan, and the US were top performers within equity. Now next is Alpha Focus, which gained 3.1%. Here we can see that we are 95% in equity, 2% in bonds, and 3% in gold. Here is Alpha Focus, which since inception, the strategy was up about 0.1%. It was a brutal time in the market. Relative to the 60-40 portfolio, we've started to get some outperformance, as you can see, that we're now 5.6% above a 60-40 portfolio. Now, we are about 0.6% below world equity, but with a lot less volatility. For equity. We have a 22% tilt to Europe, small caps, and world infotech, which did okay. And our tilt to India significantly underperformed world equity in the strategy, unfortunately. So as you recall, we, we moved into India 
and try to get exposure there. And that just didn't work in the month of March. Finally, is the all weather inflation guard for those people that want a lot less volatility. So the equity exposure is 25%, bonds is at 65%, and then the rest is at commodities and gold and the like. Uh, I think actually equity is at 30%. So here we can see since inception, the strategy was up 7.6%. And it's up about 7.3% above a 40% equity, 60% uh, stock portfolio after fees. The strategies also had a lot less volatility. We can see that it was up 1.8%, which was 0.4% above the 4060 portfolio. Our 5% target allocations to gold and to world financials did well. I'm going to stop there and switch over and just uh, come in to try to address any questions that you may have. So I'm going to come out of there and uh, good to see everybody. Now is the time to say hi and also to ask any questions. So let me just go back and see the questions that you've asked. And uh, Pia Mapon says, hello, good to see you. SP, do you think the war will spread and seriously affect the economy? Unfortunately, we have a, you know, a very difficult situation around the world. And I've been really worried about war for a while. And I think that we've the closest we are, we've been the closest to World War Three that I've ever seen in my lifetime. And um, what in my lifetime, it's been relatively peaceful. Now we've had, uh, you know, US presidents in particular poking wars in different places, but this is the scariest that I've seen. And so I definitely have concerns. And if a war comes, it's bad for everybody, except maybe the US will benefit because they'll destroy a lot of other countries. But yes, we are close to war. And all I can say is in a wartime situation, gold tends to be a, you know, a good asset class to hold. So um, we're prepared if something was to happen. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of different wars going on. And I think that these wars can be stopped right away. In fact, I'm kind of disappointed in all my friends who are really big proponents of ESG for not speaking up against war. Where have they been? We need their voices. Because I would say that if you care about society, the S in ESG would be important. All right. Super Gohan, good to see you and look forward to your uh, questions. Uh, how do you see? OK, so let's see your first question, Super Gohan. Let's see one second. So your first question is, hold on, my computer's not working very well. Your first question that I see is, how do you see developing market trends from now to the end of second quarter? Wow, that's pretty short term. Uh, I don't really look at things that short term, the end of second quarter, but... Um, you know, one of the things about developing markets is that we never had the benefits of zero interest rates. So developing markets are actually pretty robust um, in a face of higher interest rates. The problem we face is just stronger and stronger and stronger dollar. And that's forcing, you know, forcing developed markets to make adjustments. I look at my own, one of my businesses, my coffee business, where we're importing espresso machines from Italy and they just get more and more expensive. It makes me want to have a sip of coffee. So also, uh, I so I would say for, for emerging markets, I'm relatively positive at this point um, relative to the US. I'm starting to get worried about the heights of the US market. All right, let's go to the next question. What's your view for US market till election? Uh, so I think that the US is going to be pumping up the market as best they can. And Biden is going to try to push as much as he can for the Fed not to 
you know, increase interest rates anymore. In fact, maybe we'll be in a situation where the Fed is going to reduce interest rates. And that is a very real possibility for the, the U.S. I, I still believe that we are in a situation where we could see U.S. interest rates still go down very, very low if the market starts crashing. So I think the U.S. market is at risk right now. Going into the election, it's just harder and harder to pump up the market. Uh, the election is going to be crazy because if they really try to lock up Donald Trump, as they're trying very hard, um, I think that we're going to see a huge backlash of Trump supporters. Um, let's look at some of the other questions. Yeah. Um, SK Specialty 43 says, I look forward to your opinion about Iran joining the war. I think that Iran does not want to get in a war with the U.S. and does not want to get in a war with Israel. But I also think that is, re, Iran had to retaliate and they retaliated, retaliated in a way that they told the their opponents the U.S. and others, they signaled that they were going to attack and they attacked with slow drones and they gave they they attacked in a careful way because I would say that Iran's got to play very, very carefully in in a in a retaliation. If they don't retaliate to an attack from Israel, their people are going to feel like they're weak. If they do retaliate, they run the risk of getting attacked again by Israel and eventually with the support of the U.S., they're stuck in a very difficult situation. But overall, I would say that the whole hope, this is where you need a strong and thoughtful U.S. president who is focused on peace because a peaceful U.S. president would stop the confrontation between uh, Israel and Iran by getting them talking or sitting down and discussing it and trying to stop it. But I don't get the feeling like the Biden administration is doing anything to stop war. And so I hope uh, that that's some of my thoughts about what I'm seeing about Iran. Let's continue on to some other questions. Uh, Chalurm Pat says, why is U.S. inflation still sticky, especially real estate? When do you think U.S. inflation will come to the target? I think that things are expensive, you know, and prices, uh, prices, I, you know, remember there was a huge supply shock uh, around the world with industrial capacity being hit very hard during the shutdowns. And it takes years to get that capacity back. That's number one. Number two, the anticipation of inflation is part of the problem. When you anticipate future inflation, you don't bring down your prices. And therefore, we see that they're sticky coming down. In fact, companies are holding on to their profit margins. They're afraid to come down. The third part is uh, what's happening in shipping. Shipping all around the world is being affected by the confrontation that's happening in the Middle East. And the result of that is that shipping costs have expanded massively. If I just, uh, to learn part, let me mention my own case. Uh, we are importing espresso machines from uh, Italy and the prices just keep going up and they just keep going up and they just keep going up. And in fact, in Europe, what you're going to see is that they're going to be charging companies for their carbon footprint going forward in the next couple of years. And the prices are just going to go up and up and up. The last thing I would say to LearnPod is that the best form of, of management of an economy that we have ever come up with in the history of human civilization is capitalism. And people don't want capitalism anymore. They want government controls on everything. And when you get government involved, you push up prices and they never come back down. So those are some of the reasons why I think that we still have very sticky prices. I hope that answered your question, uh, but feel free to ask more. We have another question coming in. Um, uh, Pitch Pond says, as most of the markets are at their all-time high, excluding some countries like China and Thailand, what are the other markets that you think are interesting? Well, Right now, I'm looking at our strategy, and in the next couple of weeks, we're probably going to come out with our new uh, strategy. And so you're going to get an answer uh, when we reallocate our portfolio. But what I can say is that, in fact, 
it really is just the U.S. that's at all time high. And in fact, it's not just the U.S., it's just the top biggest companies, in particular the tech companies that are at all time highs. If you strip out those tech companies, the U.S. market is not at an all time high. It's actually struggling. And so I would argue that we don't have a lot of places around the world that are in a bubble. Now, we do have bubbles that have happened in the tech stocks for sure. And so that, you know, is one of the issues that I look at. But I don't see many markets around the world that expensive right now. And that's my thought on it. Anyways, those are some of your questions so far. Please keep asking your question. We have 224 people that I can see on here. You must have more questions. If you have more questions, feel free to ask. I'm going to go back into the presentation now and talk a little bit more about that. So let me just switch over. And um, I want to talk about why I think it's time to exclude China from Asia Pacific. So the continent of Asia is massive. The United Nations recognizes 49 countries in the continent of Asia. These are the countries. There's nine in Southeast Asia, seven in South Asia, four in Central Asia, eight in East Asia, and two in Oceania. And there's 30 stock exchanges across Asia Pacific. But only one of them is separated when investors are considering investing in Asia. We always talk about Asia X Japan since the day I started investing in 1993. The country, the, Japan is the only country that's considered separately by investors. So here we can see is that I'm going to propose that China is now so large that investors should consider it separately. And therefore, I look at the Shanghai, the Shenzhen, and the Hong Kong market as a separate group of companies, countries, just like I'm looking at Japan. So as Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China and heavily influenced by China, I also exclude Hong Kong. Now, India is another massive country in APAC, but from an index perspective, it's not yet time to separate it from the rest of APAC. Here's why. The populations of China and India are equally massive when compared to the U.S. and Japan. So you could argue that India should be considered separately when we look at Asia. But China's GDP is approaching the U.S. and it's far above India. We can see that China has been going up massively and is getting very close to the U.S. But in the case of India, it's also gone up massively, but it's far, far away from India. In fact, if we just look at it on a bar chart basis for the latest time period, we can see the Chinese economy is four times larger than Japan and five times larger than India. Now, though much smaller than the U.S. and Japan, China's per capita GDP is five times larger than India. China is much, much larger than India when it comes to industrial production. China's stock markets are 1.8 times larger than Japan and 2.6 times larger than India. And that's after the Indian market has been pumped up and is trading at a very high PE and the Chinese market have been pushed down trading at a very low P.E. China's stock market capitalization is now the second largest in the world at $11.5 trillion. The other challenge China faces is political. I see a risk of continued U.S. aggression against China. And I was on the U.S. Department of Defense website and I looked at this. The U.S. military sees China as its number one challenge. Here they said, they see a serious challenge to new U.S. national security in the People's Republic of China. They said the People's Republic of China, in this is in the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense document, the People's Republic of China seeks to undermine U.S. alliances. And the People's Republic of China is therefore the pacing challenge for the department, meaning the number one opponent. Now, I see that there's risk that the U.S. takes action to slow the rise of the Chinese stock markets. Here we can see, first we look at the market cap of the markets around the world. But MSCI does an investable market cap, and we can see that the investable market is only 3.9% compared to 11, or sorry, 3.9 trillion 
compared to 11.5 trillion. What that's telling us is that many of the stocks in China are not investable. This investable indice covers 99% of each market's free float adjusted market cap. And this equates to 94% of the US market, but only 34% of the Chinese market. In other words, when you're investing, when you look at this index by MSCI, it only includes uh, 34% of the Chinese market. Now, the investment world has been slow to add China to its benchmark indices because foreign ownership limits on Chinese A shares and restrictions on foreign investments. Also, because of restrictions on capital inflows and outflows of China and the regulatory environment, especially transparency and predictability of regulations. There's also operational aspects such as settlement systems, trading suspensions, and the pre-approval process for financial instruments in China. And there's limited access to derivative products and other risk management tools in the Chinese market, making managing risk exposure challenging. Also, Chinese, China continues to take steps to open up its market. It's tried to ease foreign ownership limits, improve access to foreign investors through Stock Connect, uh, and enhance regulatory transparency. Now, the main institutional index provider, MSCI, is torn between two worlds. As China grows, it is natural to add China com Chinese companies to its indices. However, any stocks that it adds must be investable or else its clients, who are fund managers, will complain that the index cannot be replicated. Now, due to many factors, it's hard to fully include Chinese stocks in its indices. So it has produced an inclusion factor methodology for Chinese stocks that it only does for Chinese stocks. Let's look at this uh, to understand. In 2019, it was a year that the inclusion went from 5% to 20%. But let's look back in time. In 2018, MSCI included large cap China A shares at only 5%. That meant only 0.7% in the emerging market benchmark at that time, instead of the full amount of 30%. They tried to prevent China from coming in until China was investable. Then that 5% went to 10%. And we see it going up to 1.6. And then it went to 15. And that 1.6 went up to 2.4. And this means by 2019, Chinese shares in August only accounted for 2.14% of the emerging market benchmark compared to its natural weighting of 29% at the time. And then in November, it went from 15 to 20%. And that brought it up to 3.3%. So what you can see is that they use the exclusion inclusion factor to try to slowly bring China into it. So why is this inclusion factor important? Because once China was included, it forced MSCI benchmark fund managers to add exposure to China. The fact that MSCI has not raised the inclusion factor since 2019 is evidence of the challenge that com the company is facing about adding China. Now, could China be removed from MSCI regional indices? Could it be removed from the emerging art market indices? I think, yes, it is possible. And this is going to be a tragedy for the Chinese market. Russia was removed from the emerging market index. Now, why China may not be excluded, I believe it's possible that the U.S. government will try to limit investing in China. Index providers and asset managers may be pressured or forced to follow suit. And U.S. pension funds may already be holding back money from investing in China because of political risk. Now, China is less correlated to most of Asia Pacific ex Japan. And that's another reason to separate China. 70 to 90 percent is considered highly correlated. 50 to 70 is considered moderately correlated. Hong Kong is highly correlated to China. Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, and Taiwan are moderately correlated to China. So the key takeaways, China and Japan are now so large and different from Asia Pacific that investors should consider them separately from the region. My view is that China should be invested in separately from Asia Pacific the same way we've gotten used to excluding Japan. And due to the massive market cap, China would ultimately dominate the index. 
the political risk investing in China is currently also considerably higher than in the rest of Asia Pacific. China is also less correlated to the rest of Asia Pacific. Now, that's part of the reason why I've been working with Thales to create a fund that excludes China. And it's called the Thales FVMR Asia Pacific X Japan X China Fund. Institutional investors have been excluding Japan from Asia Pacific benchmark for decades. And the emergence of the Chinese stock market has brought a new force into APAC, which, like Japan, should be considered separate from APAC. Since both China and Japan are massive compared to the other nine markets in APAC, I propose that investments in these two markets should now be considered separately from the rest of the region including the Thales FEMR Asia X Japan X China uh, strategy is one of the things that I'm created and will be working on soon. The fund offers investors APAC exposure without the heavyweight of these two giants, Japan and China. The fund allocates its assets to liquid U.S. listed ETFs representing nine countries in Asia Pacific. That's Australia, India, Indonesia, Korea, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Taiwan and Thailand. ASTOT's investment research is a research provider to Thales, and our proprietary FVMR framework is used to identify markets that appear most attractive. Thales's fund managers and investment committees take the research under consideration when determining the market, uh, the markets to overweight. So who is this fund for? It's for Thai investors who want to invest in APAC without exposure to the dominant markets, Japan and China. The fund is for investors who want APAC equity exposure that is well diversified across companies and markets. And we've been conducting research and testing to begin treating China separately in AWS. So in our all weather strategies, we don't we haven't yet separated out China, but we're working on that right now. Now, before we get to any Q&A, that's a lot of stuff I just went through. Let me remind you that our valuation masterclass boot camp number 15 starts on May 13th. We help finance professionals become valuation experts in months rather than years. And we have previous many students from Phenomena, uh, including Chat Chada, who is one of our students, and Tossaporn, who is one of our students, and Takon or Kelly, who is one of our students. And Juta Mas was somebody who has uh, found us through Phenomena. And uh, Boon Sim also came from Phenomena, as well as Pong Sukorn. In the Valuation Masterclass Boot Camp, you get six weeks of intensive online boot camp uh, company valuation experience. So for those people from Phenomena, just use the Phenomena code and you'll get $800. You'll, you'll save an extra hundred and get 800 off right now if you scan that QR code or go to boot camp. All right, we're ready for Q&A time right now. So I'm going to switch back over to that. Let me do that now and see if we got any questions. Uh, ABB says, uh, John, do you have a cold? I don't have a cold, but I just uh, been, I got a little stuffy, but I do not have a cold. Today, I talked a lot about the excluding China from Asia uh, index. I'm going to be rolling this out in the all weather strategies in the next few weeks. Normally in these events, when I talk, people ask me, when is the next rebalance for all weather strategy? The next rebalance for all weather strategies are going to be happening in the next one to two weeks. And then we're going to come out with our revisions. So we're working on that right now. But the main thing I just wanted to highlight is explain a little bit why I'm excluding China from the Asia X Japan. And that is it's going to give us more flexibility. I'm worried about a potential uh, war between China and the U.S. That war may not be a hot war. But that war could be a economic war. And if we do see an economic war, I want to be able to bring the China exposure down to zero in all weather strategies. And that's why I'm there. Let me take any questions that you have. I see you have 5% in gold and another 5% in commodities. Does commodities already include the gold position? Yeah, gold is a very small percent of that commodity fund. So yes, if, if you think about it, if we were to separate out the commodity portion of that, uh, sorry, the gold portion of that commodity fund, it would mean that we're owning instead of 5% gold, maybe 7% gold. So it's very small in there. And that's why we have gold as a separate asset class. 
Uh, next question comes from SP. Make sure you ask any questions. We have 259 people on this call. I wonder, do you have 259 questions? Feel free to ask any questions. We still got some time. I'm happy to answer any question. One of the questions that comes in is from SP. Do you see opportunities in Vietnam? I think, I think Vietnam has a lot of opportunities. I don't look at Vietnam for our strategies because I'm looking at emerging and developed markets and Vietnam is still a frontier market. And so I think if you're interested in Vietnam exposure, then buy one of the Vietnam funds that are out there and build that exposure there. But as of right now, I haven't brought it into our strategy. Next question. What is your view on Thai equity? Yeah, Thailand is a terrible situation in Thailand. Why is it? I gave a speech, uh, like a workshop, a couple of months ago for Institute of Directors, and we had many listed companies that attended. And I presented in that workshop, it was called Three Financial Measures That Matter Most. And I calculated the three financial measures, return on assets, earnings growth, and also net debt to equity to try to understand the companies in the room and what's happening in Thailand. But Thailand has been falling in returns for years. The profitability of the Thai market is really a disaster. And I think that we're probably near the bottom for Thailand, but Thai companies have to really wake up and you know it's not easy. I even saw that one company, a stalwart company, uh, SCG, lost money in fourth quarter. It's incredible what's happening. Now, part of what's happening, I would argue, uh, Chalurn Pat, is government and individuals are putting so much ESG pressure on companies. The stock exchange, the SEC, the government, everybody's putting S, uh, ESG uh, pressure on the companies. And when you put ESG pressures on companies, you are reducing the profitability of those companies. ESG does not increase profitability, it reduces profitability. And that's a problem for companies. And maybe uh, maybe ESG is not all of the reason why Thai companies have been falling in their profitability, but it certainly is one reason. When will people wake up to the damage that can happen to a portfolio when you are solely focused on ESG? Chalurn Pat, what do you think? Why do you think Thailand equity is doing so bad? Why do you think the underlying performance of Thai companies is doing so bad? All right, let's continue on. More questions coming in. Make sure to have your questions. Uh, Pitcha Pawn says, I'm wondering about the weighting of the new fund. Is it based on some index or totally managed by Talis? The fund is totally managed by Talis. I'm not managing the fund. I am giving uh, investment research to Talis and providing that for a service fee. Uh, and then they're using that research and then making their strategy. But I can tell you that what I'm doing with Talis is I'm providing a uh, slight. So let's just say that uh, we can start. There is no great index uh, pitch upon for uh, Asia X Japan X China. So you have to kind of construct that index. And let's imagine that we construct that index as a market cap weighted index. We take the market cap of Taiwan, of Australia, of the different countries, and then we look at the largest market cap. So it's going to be Taiwan, Australia, India, Korea, and the like. And ultimately, what's going to happen is that we then have a market cap or let's say passive uh, market cap weighting. And then what we do is provide Talis with some tilt, a little bit of tilt towards this company or this country or that country. So in that sense, it's not purely passive, but I would say it's about 70% passive, 30% active is what we're providing. Then Talis' research team operation goes into work and they decide what they're going to do as far as the weightings are concerned. So I think that that um, gives you some more information. If you have more questions about it, let me know. In the next rebalancing, uh, we're going to talk more about that fund. All right, ABB, what's your view on Mexico? Um, and I, well, I think Mexico is actually in a pretty great position right now, and they're benefiting a lot from the turmoil between China. 
and um, Mexico is in our global ETFs, but I haven't looked at it uh, individually, partially because it's the size and the tra turnover is very small. And so that's why I haven't spent much time on Mexico. But overall, Mexico seems to be a major beneficiary. All right. Uh, Pizza Point says, I'm still waiting for the day the U.S. could cut their rates. It took them quite a long time. Yeah. I've been saying that I thought they were going to cut rates from the at last end of last year and into first throughout first quarter, and they still haven't done it. It just goes to show how wrong you can be. Now, also, pitch upon, I want to mention this. Everybody can be wrong. Everybody will be wrong. And it's important whenever we're investing in the stock market that we have a strong idea about something. We believe, for instance, that interest rates are going to come down or whatever that idea is. It's important that you don't go all in to everything that you believe. Keep a balanced portfolio and make some small tilts. That's what I do. And that's the way I prevent myself from making a big mistake that costs a lot of money. All right, let's continue on. You've got further questions. ABB says, yeah, your bet's still on for D Gavin Newsom. Yes, as of right now, I still am betting on Gavin Newsom being the next president of the United States. It's a real strange one because most people don't even know Gavin Newsom. But my main point is that the Democrat Party has to get rid of Joe Biden. They can't have him for another uh, four years because of his mental capacity. And in order to get rid of him, they need to swap someone out at the last minute. And I think the safest swap for them is Gavin Newsom. And then all the Democrat supporters will then vote for Gavin Newsom. I can imagine, ABB, that we're going to see a situation where Joe Biden has to go to the hospital, he's sick, he's losing his capacity, and then the Democrat Party goes out and makes an announcement that he's not going to run for president for another term and that they're going to have another Democrat Party candidate come in. They need to announce this close to the election because they don't want to have a lot of debate and discussion within the Democrat Party of who that person should be. That's my prediction. Call me crazy, but that's what I'm thinking. So I'm still on with Gavin Newsom. All right. To learn pot says, I'm not sure if I should ask this, but, and you don't have to answer, but you sound like a Republican voter. Well, unfortunately the Republican party doesn't stand for what I stand for. And the Democrat party doesn't stand for what I stand for. I stand for very simple things. Number one, the reduction in the size of the U S federal government. I believe that the U.S. federal government should be cut by about 90%. Most of the trouble that we have in the world and in the U.S. comes from a massive federal government that can spend, 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 and that brings a huge amount. That is not a Republican or a Democrat Party platform. Second thing I believe is I am against war, and I believe that every politician must do everything in their power to negotiate and talk to stop war. I don't believe that that's a policy of the Democrat Party, and I don't believe it's a policy of the Republican Party. They are both parties of war. And therefore, I can't get behind either of the parties. So Chalurn Pot, that gives you a little bit of an answer. Feel free to ask any question. Chat Chada says, which month do you plan to rebalance the port? Uh, KP, we may be rebalancing the ports a little bit early this time. I would say in the next one to two weeks. So get ready. Get ready. All right. Uh, Sakon Tip says, hello. It's good to see you. Welcome to the stream and welcome everybody. We have 265 people here. I've been hoping we'd get 265 questions. But, hey, your questions are great so far. We still have a little bit of time. I got a lot of energy because I had a beautiful, delicious Coffee Works espresso, which I finished. And I can hear my mom in the other other room there. She's exercising. She just did an hour on the bicycle, which is incredible. I just don't know how she does it. She, we put in podcasts and she just cranks away. I'm doing well. My mom's going to turn 86 on Thursday. So we're preparing for a little bit of celebration for that. So I'm happy for that. And I hope that everybody had a great song crown and you were able to relax and come back. Feel free to ask any questions that you may have. 
If you don't have questions, we'll stop this live stream and let you get on with your day. Hopefully you enjoyed it. You got some things to think about, including the exclusion of China from Asia. You have any questions, feel free to ask now. If you don't, I want to thank everybody for joining this live stream and joining me today. Uh, feel free to ask any final questions. I do see a question from ABB says, what's your view on Bitcoin price? <clears throat> hey, Bitcoin is a what, what would be called a risk risky asset. And when things are racing up, it tends to race up a lot. And when things are racing down, it tends to go down a lot. Um, but I don't have a, a strong view on Bitcoin price. The main view that I have is when it comes to cryptocurrencies, I just try to advise people to be very careful not to overweight your portfolio with them because they're so volatile. Um, Pitchapon says, uh, yeah, you should rename from all weather to hot weather now. Yes, it is hot. Uh, very hot outside today, but we're almost through summer in April. Uh, it has been extremely hot. And uh, But I went back in time and looked at the heat when I moved to Thailand, and it was pretty much almost this hot when I came to Thailand in 1992. So uh, anyways, it was a hot summer. All right. Any final questions before we end the live stream today? I brought you some new news about the uh, Asia X Japan X China fund, and you're going to see more about that coming up when we rebalance the portfolios. Uh, uh, Chotipon says, how do you think about infrastructure and renewable funds in this year? Infrastructure tends to be a good defensive strategy. And so um, it hasn't always been defensive. But generally, I would feel positive about infrastructure funds, particularly if we go into a recessionary period. Renewable funds, I'm not exactly sure which one you're talking about, but generally renewables, just like ESG funds, tend to have lower performance and lower returns than a typical fund. But of course, it has lower returns because you know it's trying to do something good for society. And so people compromise uh, the return expectations because of that. So um, generally, I'm, I, I want to always make clear to people that ESG funds and renewable funds tend to perform poorly relative to overall funds. So just be careful of that when you go into them. All right. Well, it looks like we've come to the end of all the questions. I want to thank everybody for attending today's session. And as I said, in the next two, one to two weeks, we're going to make some changes and we're going to announce those changes. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll go through those in just a second. If you've got any final questions, make sure to send them in. Peachit says, given the Israel-Iran conflicts looked ease, will global stocks rebound this week? Yes, I think that we will see some rebound as things ease. But I also think that given what's happening, you know, we are getting close to a peak in the U.S. market in particular. Um, and maybe a peak in the U.S. dollar. We'll see. But for right now, I don't think that there's a reason. There's good reason to think that we may see uh, uh, a rebound. The one thing that I'm concerned about is that really the U.S. president should be stepping in now to talk with Israel and Iran and try to make sure that there's no escalation in the conflict in the Middle East. But I don't feel like the Biden administration or Joe Biden are doing that. And unfortunately, um, I don't think that there's many people in the U.S. government that believe in trying to stop war, unfortunately. And the war machine is trying to bring to war to us. And that I would be very worried about. Pichit, you're welcome about that. And I want to thank everybody. Let's have a great day and a great week ahead. I'll see you guys soon when we do the rebalancing. I suspect it'll be in within one to two weeks from now. So I'll see you then and I'll be talking more about our strategy. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of your day. การลงทุนก็เหมือนกีฬาวิธีเอาชนะมันมีหลากหลายสไตล์คุณเป็น trend follower, contrarian หรือ long term investor หาตัวเองให้เจอสำเร็จได้สวนบ้างดิจะให้เขาโชคอย่างเดียวหรือไง
ต้องฝึกต้องหลอกเรียกสายการคุณผมว่าเป็นลองเทอร์โกสนะครับก็เป็นสายการของคุณในระยะยาวอย่างยั่งยืนนี่โชคต้องมีกลยุทธ์จังหวะเขาออกเขาต้องรู้ต้องเรียนรู้สิ่งที่น่าสนใจคือถ้อยแถลงหลังจากนั้นนะครับที่บอกว่าเราอาจจะไม่เห็นการลดดอกเบี้ยในเร็วๆนี้ก็ได้ครับครับผมปัจจัยการลดดอกเบี้ยของธนาคารกลางสหรัฐก็ยังเป็นปัจจัยที่และถ้าอยากชนะในเกมนี้มองให้ขาดสิว่าจะชนะเกมนี้ยังไงสู้หน่อยลุกขึ้นมาหาตัวเองไม่เจอสำเร็จได้ลุยต่อลุยต่อไปนะโอเคนะออกนะเดชุบมองขาดทุกโอกาสการลงทุนฟินโนมิน่า ahead of the game